Welcome everybody to Alberta Central and Alberta Credit Union's fourth speaker series panel, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, Sparking Meaningful Conversation and Taking Real Action. Alberta Central, for those of you who don't know, is a central banking facility and trade association for Alberta's credit unions. And if this is your first time joining us, we are hosting these speaker series to bring together some of Canada's leading thinkers, forecasters and innovators to help inspire bright and prosperous futures for Albertans. Alberta Central and our member credit unions have an unwavering commitment to the communities we serve, and we want to extend our community of subject matter experts to you to share their knowledge and insights on topics that are relevant and important to all of you listening today. My name is Alexandra Frieson. I'm the Director of Communications and Strategic Planning for Alberta Central. I'm going to be your moderator for today's event. So October is Global Diversity Month, and it is a time to celebrate, educate, and pay tribute to diversity all across the globe. It's essential that we all take forward, uh, take steps forward to embrace and strengthen our knowledge and practice of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives to create a positive future for everybody. Today, we will speak to diversity, equity, and inclusion specialists in our province about what DEI is and how you can adopt positive DEI initiatives in your workplace and most importantly in your everyday life. We want this session to be informative and engaging so we ask you to please feel free to interact with us by submitting your questions into the Q&A function. I will get those uh, via text and I will make sure that I will read them out so that our specialist today can provide, provide the answers that you're looking for. Okay, so let's get to it. We're, uh, we're on the clock here and I'd like to make sure that we have time to get through all the questions. So I'd like to introduce our panelists. Joining us today is Lena Boussole, Diversity and Inclusion Specialist at Service Credit Union. Combining a Bachelor of Science in Human Ecology with over 10 years of leadership experience in the financial services industry, Lena believes that strategic focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in the workplace will drive the change that we really need to see in our communities. Lena leverages her energetic presence and a touch of humor, I like that Lena, to engage in dialogue and action towards meaningful change. Next, I would like to introduce Marcy Haranik, founder of Canadian Equality Consulting, a company that supports workplaces to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. Marcy has an MA in Conflict Resolution from Syracuse University, a Bachelor of Arts in Political Studies, and extensive experience in gender analysis, gender mainstreaming, diversity and inclusion, policy and program development, and stakeholder engagement. She also co-hosts a podcast called Exclusion, the X in brackets, you guys can't see that, an exploration of equity, diversity, and inclusion best practices. So Lena, Marcy, thank you so much for joining us today. I've been really excited about this discussion, and we're just going to get right into it. Okay, first question. So diversity, inclusion, and equity is a very complex and very critically important topic. So that said, I'd actually like to break apart each element of that acronym um, so that we all have a really good understanding of what those different elements mean. So I'll ask each of you, and I'll start with Marcy, how do you define each component? How do you define the D? How do you define the E? How do you define the I? Um, and yeah, Marcy, please go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, this is a great question. Thanks for having me. Um, so DEI or diversity, equity and inclusion, like you mentioned, it, it is very complex and, and really important. And one element can't be done without the other. So you've probably heard of programs that just use the acronym DNI or just look at diversity and inclusion, but you can't really even get to the I without the E. So equity is super important uh, in this sort of process. Um, but how I look at it, um, is starting with diversity. Um, to me, diversity is all about identities and experiences and unique perspectives. Um, but it's also, it's a relational concept. So no person is on their own diverse. There's no such thing as a diverse candidate, um, but there are diverse organizations or diverse workplaces or diverse groups of people. Um, and also diversity, because it's really focused on, on identities as well, it can include a lot of different 
um, demographic factors. So it, it looks at um, sex and gender, sexual orientation, language, disability, race, ethnicity, lang uh, location, and, and even more. Um, so that's kind of the D, the diversity component. And often um, when we talk about diversity and do diversity initiatives, it's about those sort of numbers of demographic groups, trying to get more folks in the door. Um, whereas equity is more about the process or activity that'll then lead you to inclusion. And it recognizes that different people have very different experiences, different barriers, different needs. And equity is where we then design systems or processes or activities um, to support those unique needs of people so that everyone can be successful. Um, and then sort of the D, this is, this is how I think about it, is the D plus E equals I. And then getting to the inclusion piece uh, is like that result. It's that slow build of diversity plus equity. Um, it's the building of a culture that's inclusive where all people feel valued and appreciated. They feel like they belong. They can show up as them, their full selves uh, authentically and be able to fully participate. Um, so again, I kind of look at it as D plus E equals I um, and all of that together really helps uh, advance um, the overarching outcome or, or goal of equality where there are no barriers specific to any groups and where everyone can participate fully and are equally valued. That's great, Marcy. I like I like that equation. That's a really great way to visualize that and capture that. So thank you for that. Lena, let's go over to you. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge the land that I'm joining you from, which is Treaty 6 land, the traditional meeting ground of the Nehiawak, the Soto, the Blackfoot, Dene, Nakota Sioux, Métis Settlements, and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Um, I think what we're doing here is really great and breaking down each one of these components. Um, so diversity, I like to uh, tell people is just anything that makes you different than the person sitting next to you. That's a really simplistic way, but it's all of those ways that make you different from the person beside you. Um, and understanding that layers upon layers, so that intersectionality of any of those two identities together um, really highlights how diverse we are. Um, I also like to say that a person is unique and when we get together, groups of people are diverse. It's really important to understand that each person's perspective is unique and they can't speak for an entire uh, group or population of people. Um, inclusion is really that, that feeling of my, I'm bringing forward my ideas, but they're being heard as well. So they matter. I matter to an organization or I matter to a group of people when I offer my opinion and it is actually heard. Um, equity is that work piece that Marcy was talking about. It's really where the rubber meets the road. Um, you need to be understanding how historical and systemic barriers impact people and actively dismantling those barriers, shifting resources, redistributing power um, to underrepresented or underserved populations. Great, thank you. So I think it's fair of me to say, hopefully, that both of you are advocates, obviously, uh, considering what you do and what you're passionate about here. You're advocates for, for DEI. So let's, let's talk a little bit about how you got into that. Uh, what's influenced your thinking in this area? And how, what brought you to get to where you are today uh, in that advocacy role? And Lena, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, I mean, growing up as um, a child of immigrant parents, um, sadly experiencing racism, harassment, uh, forms of discrimination, um, and watching others face similar situations. Uh, I've been in leadership, so I, I've been in branch land for um, actually all of my career with, uh, within the financial institutions. And watching others experience that and not having or not feeling as though they have the voice um, kind of brought me to, I've always had that passion for d &I. I just don't think I ever labeled it as such, um, but watching others struggle to find their voice in this space, I think that's what really was the catalyst for me changing from a branch manager into let's, let's change a whole organization and a whole industry. That's great. Marcy, what about you? Sure. Um, I, I first started out um, 
through schooling in the international human rights field and really with that heavy focus on conflict resolution. So I always liked looking at like big, complex, messy, systemic challenges or problems, and then trying to use sort of conflict resolution theories and human rights theories to try to break them down and understand and work to resolve them. So that was something that I was always just been really passionate about um, in learning. And then when I joined um, the workforce, um, I, I always expected the world to be unequal and workplaces to still be unequal. Um, but uh, it was much worse than I had anticipated and much more subtle, um, but still just as incredibly impactful. So I feel like my, my interest and passion for largely human rights and gender equity um, combined with this personal lived experience, being a woman, um, being a parent um, in the workplace um, and, uh, and struggling with my own challenges, um, all fueled this sort of passion uh, for this work and desire to try to resolve things and solve things. Um, and, uh, and a big part of it was definitely influenced by, um, I did my undergrad in Manitoba and did a lot of work with refugee and new immigrant communities um, so I really, uh, it's important um, for me uh, to approach DEI with, uh, with that intersectional lens as, as Lena referenced to, and um, which I think is really required to fully understand like the depth and complexity of these challenges. Right, right. Um, okay, thank you for that. So now having your, the an understanding of your, both of your individual definitions of DEI, let's bring that back to an organizational perspective. So for organizations, what does understanding each of those elements that we just talked about bring to a company's culture, but also to their customer base? Lena, let's start with you. I think that intersectionality piece is where um, things really change in terms of understanding diversity. So we break it apart. It's very, like I said, it's very important that we do break these things apart and we're not just using DEI as a catchphrase or a catch-all. Um, specifically around diversity, I think understanding how intersectionality impacts folks. So, um, you know, we're talking about uh, the pink pandemic where women are having to leave the workforce uh, more than men during, during this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but are we looking even deeper into that and seeing how that impacts um, women of color, um, Indigenous women, um, the LGBTQ2S plus community, um, where that intersectionality really um, comes into play. That, that I think is taking each of these things and breaking it down. So now we can cater solutions, we can cater um, our advice when we understand our, uh, our employees and our member bases more and more um, through breaking down each one of those components on its own. Right. Marcy, from your perspective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was great. Um, I think also by breaking down the D, the E, and the I and looking at it differently, I mean, both, all three elements look at different, very different things in an organization. Um, so when you're doing a, even when you're doing a baseline assessment to try to see where you're starting from, um, it's really important to, to take three different lenses and different approaches to those in order to really understand what's going on. Um, but once an organization has that understanding um, and, uh, and the benefits that it can bring um, to a company's culture and customer base, um, it's uh, often you hear about news reports or studies talking about these benefits of diversity and diverse organizations. Um, but a lot of those are actually from inclusive organizations um, that have the diversity and the equity in place, or then it compounds and becomes much more positive. So um, you know, there's a lot of stats and studies out there that talk about the, the, the traditional business case about profitability and innovation, um, customer reputation, that sort of thing. But there's also some really fascinating studies that have shown inclusive teams uh, improve team performance um, by over 30% in um, inclusive environments. Um, when also when employees feel included, they're more engaged. So highly engaged employees tend to go the extra mile. Um, people working in inclusive workplaces also tend to have better physical and mental health and take less leave um, for a variety of health issues. Um, so, and there's also found that diverse and inclusive teams have a 60% improvement in decision-making. So there's a lot of 
compelling statistics that can be pulled and relied on for folks when you're trying to um, push or advocate for this in, in your organization that really kind of build the case for this um, benefits to your culture and your customer base. Right. And that, and that's, that's a great segue, Marcy um, and Lena into my next question, because uh, you know, you talk about statistics, so, and, and measurement. So for an organization, it, you know, it's one thing to say that you're developing a diverse and equitable and inclusive organization, but it really is another thing to actually do it and then evaluate your success on that. Right. So for those who are listening, who may be part of an organization, what are some of the metrics that companies can implement to measure their success in this and to make sure that they're really, you know, walking the talk and able to demonstrate that through data? And anybody can jump in. I think from services perspective, this, we're just starting to get um, into this right now. And we want to find metrics that are authentic to what we want to accomplish. So the very first thing that we, we did was we sent out an employee in, uh, DNI engagement survey um, in February of this year to see what's our benchmark, what's our feeling of our employees, um, and how do we take what's important to them and move that forward? Uh, I think we, we, we are pretty new in this space and we want to take the time to do this authentically and from uh, like a really good educated lens. So we're pretty new to this space, but we, we want to do what's important for our employee base. Right. Yeah, I think just building off of what Lena shared is that um, establishing sort of KPIs specific to your activities that are meaningful are so important. Um, there are some metrics out there that um, can help you uh, that you could maybe adapt or, or learn or use from. The Government of Canada has some available. The Tri-Agency Research Council, which is part of Government of Canada, um, they have some available if you're doing sort of um, research or project-based work. Otherwise, um, we've worked with some organizations on incorporating the metrics from the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so there's a lot that you can kind of build off of or, or tailor, um, but hundred percent before you start measuring, you really need to ensure your organization has the data so that you can effectively measure. And, um, so it's so important to, to collect that diversity, disaggregated data internal to your organization. Um, <clears throat> and also even with stakeholders or the community that you aim to serve so that you can actually create metrics that are meaningful and measurable over time. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Lena, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over and focus uh, on you in particular in your work uh, um, with um, Service Credit Union. I know that service has recently changed its council's name from Diversity and Inclusion Council to Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Belonging Council. So can you discuss let us know what prompted this and what is the significance of the shift uh, for the organization, for employees, for the community, for your members? Yeah, I think we went from, so diversity is kind of collecting that numbers data. So we can have a ton of folks who are, who identify themselves as within the BIPOC community, but are we really being inclusive when we do that? Um, so we wanted to take it that step fur further with that equity piece where the work really happens in identifying what we do that maybe we didn't realize is part of a problem, a systemic issue. Um, so we, we really dove into the research to say, okay, DNI was nice. It was probably nice 20 years ago. It's time to go forward. It's time to do more um, and get more done in a very strategic and focused way. Um, we at service kind of say D plus E plus I equals V. So I kind of took Marcy's a little bit further than that. We want folks to feel like they belong. And part of that is that, um, that inclusion, like, okay, I am bringing myself here. I am actually contributing and my ideas are being heard because of the equity work that has been done to remove barriers from my participation. Um, so adding those all together, really feeling like this is an organization I feel like I belong at. Um, but we really, we started off with DNI, and I think we were, uh, we wanted to do, again, do the research, make sure we were doing it from a, a place of authenticity. 
Um, and when we when we looked at it, we realized DNI was nice maybe 20 years ago. It's time to go one step, maybe one step or two steps further. Okay. So um, question for you then that's come in, and I'm going to direct it at Lena, uh, just as we continue to build on on services work here. What strategies? You talked a little bit about authenticity, Lena. You used that word. What strategies do you employ to ensure that the D uh, EI work that service is doing um, is and feels authentic to employees and potential employees? Um, I think the major thing that we do is right now we have a DEIB council. Uh, we have an executive sponsor that is our chief people officer. And there is honest and open feedback there. They are the voice of the employee. We are really trying to do this grassroots um, from the bottom up because we understand that our employees um, have the, ex the life experiences that maybe our executive leadership team has never been exposed to. Um, and so always meeting people where they are at. Um, I think another piece of this is allowing people to say, I don't know. And I think that also extends upwards to our leadership. They are new to this too. This work is it's hard work. It is extremely sometimes emotional work um, and maybe something they've never experienced. So I think keeping it authentic to understanding each individual person and where they are uh, at along this particular journey. I think that's really key to authenticity. So you, you tweaked me there, Lena, with something that you said. So uh, I'm going off the scripted questions here for a second, but uh, you, you made a point about this being grassroots, and I really like that. Um, and so this question is actually for Marcy. I would assume, and so you tell me if I'm wrong in this assumption or not, but I would think that for these initiatives to be successful, it really does uh, depend on that grassroots uh, experience, knowledge transfer, um, but also just as much on a leadership that really wants to be open to that and understands that it's really the whole organization. Marcy, from your experience of working with organizations, you know, could you add some commentary around the effectiveness? I'm, I'm going to guess it's everybody needs to be uh, committed and involved, but I'd rather mm -hmm. hear from you than me making it. <laughs> no, I think you're spot on. Um, in a hundred percent to be sustainable for sure. And to be effective, it has to be everybody's responsibility. So often you can, we've sometimes, sometimes see, um, DEI work solely on the side of one person's desk in HR, right. Or part of a committee that's entirely volunteer run that's has to do it off the side of their desk without allocated resources. So it has to, it's really important that it doesn't get siloed in one place, that it's disseminated and communicated that, you know, and it's really empowering and it's positive that everyone has a role to play in this journey. Um, you definitely have to have that demonstrated buy-in from senior leaders, but the senior leaders should never be running it or running the show. So for instance, DEI, core to DEI work is nothing about you without you. So ensuring that it's grassroots run, um, that, um, that you're taking the, the ideas um, and the unique barriers and challenges that your own employees um, and those most marginalized in your organization are experiencing to kind of guide the way is critical. So, and you can do that through, you know, annual surveying, but qualitative is so important for any type of DEI work because you need to center the voices and experiences and amplify those of the most marginalized. And you don't get a sense of that entirely on quantitative data. So. Um, ensuring that you also do like focus groups or consultations um, with key areas of the org um, to fully understand the, the impact and, and also get ideas on how to improve things. Um, while also then looking at, you know, your policies and making sure there's no sort of systemic barriers baked in in your systems. Um, but overall, everything, it's so critically important for it to be um, that grassroots based and and community collaboration and co-creation is, is critical to the success for sure. Yeah, excellent. Um, so Lena, I'm gonna go back to you. I wanna talk a little bit more about services um, um, council. With this council, so we've talked about employees. With this council, however, what is the main message you are, you are telling your members and, and potential members? 
That's a great question. And I think it's one when we're a little bit more mature down the road. And I say that because we, if we go out to our members and say to them, we are, uh, you know, a diverse uh, organization, we are very inclusive, everybody feels like they belong. And those folks come to us and experience a situation where that is not the case, that, that is, you know, a lot of people are, are ready to call you out if that's the case. Um, we want to make sure our house is in order before we go out there and say to our members, here's what we're doing and here's why we're doing it. We're setting the foundation to be able to do that by, you know, my role as the DNI specialist, the DEIB council, um, you know, our employee resource circles. Um, we do, however, start from hearing from our employees saying, you know, we're sometimes not feeling safe. And I know there was a report recently that more and more frontline workers are experiencing racism and, and harassment at work. So we are very, you know, are one of our very first items to, to tackle is how do we in, in, uh, communicate to our members that our spaces are safe, that we won't tolerate that type of behavior because our employees are our members as well and they deserve a safe space, safe space just as much as our members do. You know, that's a, that's that's a great answer. And I think that, you know, you touch upon what Marcy was saying about not having someone doing this off the side of their desk. Right. It really is. It really is a collective community thing. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, last question for you, Lena, around uh, services council. Uh, what successes uh, and outcomes to date has service credit union realized from its DI initiatives um, and or some best practices? Yeah, the last 16 months have been amazing with this group of people from all across the province and all across business lines. We have uh, recently in the past year updated our banking system to include the X gender identifier. Um, we have included pronouns in our signature lines. We're looking at ways that we can further that, uh, that space in terms of safety for the LGBTQ2S plus community. Uh, we developed a land acknowledgement in collaboration with an Indigenous organization, um, and we are using it in our executive leadership team meetings. We're starting to roll it out, and, and how do we use this? Why do we use this most importantly? Um, we're really focusing on the things that our employees are trying to tell us are important, and that safe space one is really important. We're developing policy around, you know, what do we do when we do have members in here who are maybe behaving in ways that we don't, we don't want our employees to have to face? So we're talking about ways that we are um, impacting our employees the most. So lots of good things. I think the best practice we've gotten so far is to meet people where they are at. You have an, an organization with over 2,000 employees. Each of those employees is going to be at a different spot on the, on the path. Um, and I think just making sure that we acknowledge that and we try to bring everybody along on the journey with us. That's excellent, thank you. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, for Gen Z and millennials, diversity and inclusion isn't a nice to have. It's a full on requirement. So Marcy, this question is directed to you. Are you seeing indicators that Gen Z and millennial professionals are actively researching and avoiding companies without a clear commitment to DEI? Yes. Short answer, yes. Longer answer is, um, yeah, it's, it's amazing to see really. Um, McKinsey had done a study, I think it was a couple of years back now, but they had done a study to see, you know, what, what, um, what is the most convincing case for change to invest in DEI for different levels of an organization? And when they looked at millennials and, and uh, Gen Z, um, it, was, uh, it was that it's the right thing to do. Like they're entering the workforce already bought in and already expecting um, this to be a priority or to be at least a consideration. Um, so it's, uh, it's fantastic. I'd say a lot of the companies that we have worked with and that we're currently working with um, are doing this or have started to do DEI work and prioritize it because their own internal workforce um, is putting the pressure on them and uh, asking them to do it and, and holding them accountable to it, um, which is really exciting to see. Um, we also know um, there was a, a recent study that said 67% of workers consider diversity of an organization when they're looking at employment 
Um, and 72% of women, 89% of black respondents and 80% of Asian respondents said workforce diversity was important to them in selecting a place to work. Um, and also a majority of the white respondents also said workforce diversity was one of the top priorities for them. Um, so it's definitely, uh, the momentum is there and I think it's just gonna keep building. Marthy, a quick question to build on what you've said there. How, how would one actually go about understanding uh, a company, a potential employer's commitment? So you see a lot of if you apply for a job, you know, in the job posting, they typically have that statement, you know, we are, you know, a diverse employer, equitable employer. But if someone actually really wanted to go do some research, how would you recommend that somebody goes ahead to do that? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um, because often that's all you'll see is the little diversity statement or another cent and often it'll be, we're an equal opportunity employer, which basically is code for, we follow the employment equity act, which is bare minimum for right. anything DEI. <laughs> so I feel like to, if you want to get past that, and if you want to like determine what could be performative versus genuine, um, look at their strategic plan. If they post that on the website. Um, take a look at it, see if they embed DEI anywhere in the organization, if it's siloed or if it's as a strategic priority or how different uh, areas within the organization are responsible for it. Um, you can look at um, often uh, organizations will post like pictures and bios for all their board members or their leaders. So you can get a sense of kind of where they may be in diverse, diversity and leadership representation. Um, and then I really encourage folks to ask these questions in the interview. Um, so if you're in an interview um, and uh, ask them, like, what are you doing to advance DEI here? Or how are you, um, you know, advancing or, or supporting um, employees that may be more uh, marginalized in the organization? And, and really ask, don't be afraid to ask those hard questions. Oh, that's great. Um, so there's more than 6 million people in Canada who identify themselves as a member of a visible minority group. Uh, Lena, as a Lebanese Syrian Canadian, how does this influence who you are as a person? And you talked a little bit about this already, but let's let, tell us again how you show up in the workplace to create change with that background. Yeah, I, I think uh, this is one of those questions where I, I don't think of myself as you know, as I'm sitting here today, uh, one of the persons, one of the people on the council actually articulated this so well. She said, you know, I don't notice, I, I think I'm Canadian until somebody points out that I'm not. Mm. Um, and so I think that really brings forward those feelings of, I call it living on the hyphen. So I hyphen, I, you know, I got a balance between being, you know, Lebanese Syrian and Lebanese Canadian and all those different things. Um, it also allows me to stop and check my own biases. I come to this world just like anybody else. It's really nice to have specialists in my title, but I come to this world just like anybody else with, you know, a, a background of growing up. Um, and I need to maybe sometimes check that in myself well before I step forward into the work. What is keeping me from maybe um, opening up in this space as much as I could? Um, but really understanding yourself, self-awareness, super important to this work. As long as you are open to understanding that ways that you've grown up, ways that you've learned in the past, if you're open to not only learning something new, but unlearning things you've learned in the past, that has been key to how I bring myself to the DEI space um, as a Lebanese Syrian Canadian. Yeah, I think that's great, Lena. I think you just touch on such an important thing and that's that self-awareness, right? Yes. And being really really focused in on yourself and like you said the own biases you bring forward so I think that's a really great point um, so let's talk about education a little bit uh, so it's critical in terms of creating sustainable change right in this particular space um, Marcy how can employees and employers educate themselves on this topic um, and even more importantly just to build on what Lena said to get comfortable with it, to recognize any self-awareness uh, issues that they might have, any pre-existing biases that they might have. So I'm talking, obviously, the, you know, an organization might provide educational opportunities, but even beyond that. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. There are a ton of free and accessible resources online and on social media um, that are available. You just make sure to check the sources to ensure they're credible. Um, but uh, other than that, um, to kind of enhance your own self-awareness as well, um, a, a good way to start, um, there's a free online um, questionnaire done by um, Project Implicit at uh, Harvard University. It's called the Implicit Association Test. Um, if you just Google it, um, it takes maybe two minutes at most um, for, and it has a list of different kind of identity types that you can then click and, and then see how biased you are. And the results, don't be discouraged. Everyone is much more biased than you ever think you are. Um, and that's just a really great tool to kind of to have that initial recognition and awareness. And then the next step is to actively do something about it. So to um, create maybe a personal action plan, um, commit to watching, you know, X number of TED Talks or YouTube videos on this topic a month um, or read um, this number of books um, in a year. Um, so try to create um, goals for yourself and share them with others to hold yourself accountable. Right. I like that. I, I, I like how you take that opportunity of if your score is maybe a little higher than you anticipated on that biases test. You actually turned that into a positive. And I think, I think that's, a, that's a great message for everyone listening. I just wanna take a break here for a quick second to remind our participants, please do put something into the chat. Um, you know, our specialists here today are so happy to answer any questions that you might have. So uh, don't hesitate, we'll, we'll get to it for sure. Um, I have another question. Uh, around going back to employees and, and this builds a little bit upon what Lena mentioned about how maybe employees within branches, for example, aren't comfortable, uh, you know, if, if they're aren't comfortable saying anything, if they're finding themselves in an uncomfortable situation. So how, how Marcy and, and Lena, you chime in too, if you're interested, how would you recommend working with those employees and, and teaching them um, to feel comfortable, uh, coaching them to, to feel comfortable with not being okay with being tokenized or, or marginalized. How would you go about handling those kinds of situations? Mm -hmm. It's tricky for sure. Um, and we don't wanna put the onus necessarily on the person that's being tokenized or, or marginalized um, because it's, it shouldn't be entirely on them to, to try to solve or push back against this whole system that's been designed to exclude them. Um, so we really focus on the, the broader system um, and, uh, and the policies that are in place to help folks or the resources that may be available for them to seek help if they need it, um, but, and also try to prevent this from happening in the first place. And, and you mentioned tokenism um, and we see that often in organizations, um, maybe they're at the beginning of the DEI journey um, where they'll kind of just delegate um, the, create a DEI strategy for us and they'll give it to the one woman on their team or the one racialized person on their team um, without, you know, and then they're tasked to lead complex systemic um, work without much budget or support, right? So the key around avoiding that, um, tokenism too, is looking beyond just um, selecting someone or involving someone just because of maybe a community they represent. That visibility is important, but those but you have to give people the actual power and influence that they deserve in those positions. Um, so really visibility is important, but if it's not also substantive, then it's really just performative. Yeah, no, I think that's great. Um, okay, I'm looking at the time and uh, we've got about five minutes left. I think there's a few questions that have maybe come in here in the chat. I'm not sure, but um, I want to get to uh, DEI advocacy. So uh, for both of you, we'll start with Lena. Uh, what's your biggest piece of advice for getting started with DEI? Uh, so my biggest piece of advice is get started. Um, oftentimes we're stuck in that research space where we're just, you know, uh, data analysis and looking at all of the things that are out there, but there's no action. And, and Marcy kind of mentioned that, like, we need to put an action plan. So we've now looked at all of these ways that maybe we do need to work on our, our biases and things like that. But to actually get out there and start making an action plan 
um, is really important. And it's really hard. That first step is going to be really hard, but make it a small one. Marcy mentioned, like, read a book by someone you've never heard of before, someone from a, a BIPOC background. Um, there are many uh, bookstores now that are catering to that um, lesser known authors. Um, and then, you know, those are the types of things that I would say. One of the easiest ways to get involved, I think, is to look at the language that you're using on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. You know, are you asking people, you know, how's your husband? Instead of that, maybe we could start asking, how's your spouse or your significant other? Small changes in language that may not seem very large for someone who is the, the quote unquote norm, um, that can have a huge impact for others. So there are small ways that you can start to examine the language that you use um, and that'll get you started and that'll be kind of your, your gateway to doing the bigger things. Right, that's great, thank you. Marcy, what about you? What's the big, biggest piece of advice? I think just, just building off of what Lena said too, I think um, don't be afraid to make mistakes and think of progress, not perfection. Um, there is no perfect person. There's no perfect advocate in DI space. We're all on our own journeys and we're all still continually unlearning and learning. Um, and, uh, and based on that, I think just starting by asking those hard questions um, and, uh, and learning from them. Um, so kind of asking, you know, within your own realm of influence or sphere of influence in your company or your organization, just asking questions like what are, what are some of the experiences of marginalized people in our workplace? What could we do better to support them? You know, do we have diversity goals? Do we collect diversity data? Just starting to kind of poke and ask questions and, um, and then learn is, uh, is a great place to start. Yeah. I really like that. And I know that in the chat, there were some questions, there was an ask there for that link uh, to the bias quiz. And I believe Marcy, you have put that into the chat. So I think that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and, you know, we've talked a lot about resources and I think, you know, for me, what I've gathered from, from, this, um, from this particular session is just really getting started, getting, getting educated, not expecting to be perfect right out of the gate. And I really, really appreciate um, the information that you've both shared with us today. I really hope it was useful for all the other participants as well. I know I, I gathered a lot out of it. I'm looking at the time and we've only got about um, three minutes left. So uh, before we uh, end today's event, again, first and foremost, I would really like to thank Lena, uh, who joins us from Service Credit Union. I'd really like to thank Marcy as well. Uh, I know we have, uh, we've leveraged Marcy's expertise before. And so really appreciate, um, really appreciate you joining us today and giving us the great insights that you did. So thanks again. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to invite everyone to share their feedback. Uh, we have a really, 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 really quick uh, Slido poll that uh, should be accessible on the screen. Here we go. Uh, if you could just share your answers with us. Uh, they are anonymous, so it won't be put up for everybody. So I'll give you guys a second here to answer those. I'm going to actually shut that down. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. That takes us to the end of the session. Again, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, we are having a couple more speaker sessions that are going to be taking place. There's another one in November that we're going to focus on financial literacy. Then we're also going to focus on cybersecurity and fraud in December, just in time for that Christmas season. Um, and so please do join us uh, for those sessions as well. We, as well. we will be sending out that information um, um, to everybody who participated today. If you want to learn more about a credit union, please visit albertacreditunions.com. Uh, our Credit Unions of Alberta website has a lot of different information. Please also check out Marcy's site. Maybe Marcy, you can put that into the chat for us. And if you're interested in learning more about Service Credit Union, please go to service.ca. That's S-E-R-V-U-S dot C-A. And I wish you all a very wonderful rest of the day. And thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Take care.